Hello and welcome to Footnotes the Cicerone podcast, a podcast to inspire you about outdoor travel and activities in the UK and across the world. I'm Hannah and I hope you enjoy this episode. Today I'm chatting to Brian Jones, who is the Head of School for Sports and Health Sciences at the University of Central Lancashire, also known as UCLan. So if we call it UCLan, it's the same thing. He's a peak bagger and general plodder. He's also a bit of an advocate for the importance of getting outdoors and, and the benefit on mental health and your general well-being. This is something that we've discussed a little bit on the podcast. It's something that I am really passionate about as well. So we've definitely kind of hinted at it, but actually we're, we're going to slightly indulge ourselves and just spend the whole episode talking to Brian about the benefit of getting outdoors. Hi, Brian. Thank you for joining me. Do you want to just introduce yourself a little bit? I will do. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, so my, my background is I'm from the, the beautiful county of Lancashire, just outside the Forest of Boland, which uh, I'm very proud of. And I, when I was a kid, that was my playground, essentially. So I was out and about all the time. And that's never left me, it being in the outdoors and, and uh, just being in sort of green space that's always been my life my life then took a turn into professional sport so i was i've been all over the world doing a variety of different things in professional sport but i've always returned to the outdoors and you know being in my own space in in the outdoors this job has has taken me into a role where not only am i focused on sport but i'm also focused on health working with paramedics nurses physiotherapists all these all these types of individuals and there's this space in the middle where we have a division in the outdoors where we were very focused around the outdoors for leadership. But I saw this void, really, for focusing on the outdoors and this problem that we've got in society at the moment around physical and mental health, and that we have this resource that's available to everybody, the green space, that we're not utilising, but everybody's queuing up at the hospitals. It's almost become a bit of a mission of mine now to try and get more people aware of the benefits of being in the outdoors, even just sitting down in a forest Never mind walking and or kayaking or or all those other activities. I just I'm trying to change the narrative because again, people talk about health from a negative perspective, and if we focus in on something like mental health, we make the assumption it's all about being negative. And actually, there's there's a whole the whole movement around positive psychology, and it's all about promoting doing things to have positive emotions and positive thinking rather than guarding against negative health. And I think the outdoors is a perfect environment for that. Yeah, I mean, there's, there are definitely physical health benefits to getting outdoors and, and we know about those and they've been kind of proven. I feel like I've done a, a one woman study on the value of the outdoors for mental health through my life so far. And and I know it works for me that if I feel stressed or anything, I, I know that if I get out and I look at a view, it makes me feel, I think I've, I've said this before on the podcast, but it makes me feel comfortingly small. You know, if I look out at a massive view and I just realise that I am, I am just this one person in amongst it all, it kind of reassures me that whatever is, is taking up too much headspace for me isn't actually a big deal. It might feel like it at that moment and it, it's horrible when that happens, but getting out and looking at the sea or standing at the top of a hill and looking out at the view it just it helps me kind of reset my priorities and get a bit of clarity on how I'm feeling and and how important things really are for me and I know that lots of people will sort of that will resonate with a lot of people but is there any actual proof that it's good for you in that way? Yeah, there used to be a lot of what they call relationship studies. There's a strong correlation between being in the outdoors and having the more positive mental health. But more recently, they've been doing clinic, a lot of clinical trials on the relation, not just the relationship, but actually does it have an impact? And there's some really good studies coming out around forest bathing. So this thing in Japan called Shinrin Yoku, uh, and it's it's a form of just just putting yourself in a forest. And the trees give off this uh, chemical. It's uh, they call them phytoncides, and there is a there is an absolute causal relationship between the, the release of those phytoncides and a reduction on things like inflammation in the human being. So inflammation is the cause of cardiovascular disease. It's the cause of cancers, but it's also one of the precursors for things like depression and anxiety as well. So if you can reduce inflammation then you can have a, a positive influence on, on other, other aspects of the human body. So simply just sitting in a forest will have a positive impact on your health, both physically and mentally. So that more and more studies like that showing that the immersion in that particular environment will have a positive impact on, on your physical and mental health. That's really encouraging. And, I, and I'm not convinced that everybody is aware of that. And people like you, 
that, that, that are already advocates and put yourself in that environment, you benefit from that. But there's an awful lot of people that think because they live in an urban environment that they can't experience the same as you. You know, th this concept of perspective and to be able to switch off. I mean, I always talk about the human brain as like a jukebox and for the younger members of the audience, uh, MP3 players, which is essentially, it's, it's got, it's, you're playing a record and you have a volume control. And I think sometimes we end up playing the wrong record at the wrong volume. And the one thing about the outdoors, same for me as it does for you, is it's a way of turning the volume right down and resetting the, 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 the record that you're playing. We're really, really good as human beings of creating what we call cognitive distortions or, or thought errors, where we, we, we end up putting ourselves in stressful environments and we end up catastrophizing or, or making inappropriate conclusions about something that is causing stress. And what the outdoors does is it gives you that opportunity to press the reset button, play the right record and get the volume at the right level and put things into perspective and go again. You know, so it, it's a really, really positive thing for us to do. Yeah. And it's interesting, actually, that you use the example of forest bathing. That is it is literally just going and sitting near some trees because that doesn't apart from the effort of getting to the trees, it's not a big, intense activity. You're not having to, you know, exert yourself particularly for that. So that's a completely separate benefit from releasing endorphins through exercise in the outdoors, isn't it? Yeah, if you differentiate the two, you know, you have you have an exercise component to the outdoors, which is, you know, some people get addicted to that. I think I'm getting addicted to it. My legs are killing me from yesterday's walk, but I'm getting old. But this idea, you can actually put headphones on and close your eyes and sit in a forest and still get health benefits from being in that environment. You know, that, that's the that's the beauty of just being in a green space, particularly in a forest with lots of trees. But the whole the whole point of mindfulness is about, you know, putting yourself in that particular place, that that green space, and just paying attention to all the things around you. It, that that's it's a fantastic experience. And I know it's not for everybody. People have their own strategies about how they want to relax or how they want to press that reset button as we talked about earlier. But mindfulness is really good at just saying, right, just, just sit down, take a deep breath and just take a look around you at the different colours, at the animals that are in your in your space. And all of a sudden what that's done is it's distracted you away from whatever was bothering you beforehand. And that's that's a real positive thing. It reduces things like heart rate, it reduces blood pressure and has a real knock on effect to all of those other things that lead to long term health problems. So if we can create those types of spaces all over the place, I mean, we, the thing is, green the green space is everywhere. You know, that you can't get away from it. Even in London, there's loads of green spaces in London. So, you know, go into those green spaces and get the benefit. But, you know, the other side of that is, is if you can combine the exercise, and again, you can scale that exercise to whatever level you like, and being in a green space, then you're going to get the best of both worlds. You get the physical benefit for both, and you get the, the mental benefit for both as well. So it's, it's just, it's the perfect form of prescription. You know, rather than taking medication for something, you know, the outdoors will solve the problem. It's relatively cheap unless you're spending a fortune on car parking and fancy kit. It's just a no brainer. And, and I don't think there's enough people really aware of that, that some very simple lifestyle changes can have a dramatic impact on people's health. I'm, I'm middle age. I'm now over 50 and a number of people that have health problems that for me are crying out to be in the outdoors. And yet they won't. They'll take pills. They'll pay their money for their prescriptions and they'll continue to be indoors watching whatever they're watching on TV. That's my mission, really, is to try and get more people aware of the benefits and get them out. Yeah, I think it's important just to just to interject that we're, we're not saying do this instead of seek you know professional medical opinions that we're not talking about this as medical experts in in any way so please don't throw all your tablets away and think that sitting near a tree is going to cure whatever ailments you've got but it is it is a tool that you can use and like you said that there should be fewer barriers to doing that because you you don't need to buy lots of fancy kit there is green space everywhere i think you know even in the most urban areas that there, there are park spaces and it doesn't have to be something really energetic either so it is yeah it, it should be something that lots of people could do but it's maybe people just don't think about that as a well potentially it could, be a confidence, it could be a confidence thing as well you know the assumption is you go into the outdoors that you're going to have to go and you know climb the black coolings straight away and it's it's not like that at all it's 
you know, you scale it. And, and even talking about trails, you know, if you look at something like the West Island Way, you don't have to complete it in, in six days, you know, five days. You can take as long as you like and you can do it in stages. It's just it's just doing something that will make a difference. And you're right, you know, if you've been prescribed medication, it, it, chances are you've got a doctor that's used to prescribing medication. But what I will say, there's a lot more people around uh, around the country now who are doctors that are using more of social prescribing, and it's a it's a phenomenon. Well, it's it's, a, it's an agenda by the NHS that is 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 one of the things that I think is going to save the NHS because there are now people. If you are prehypertensive, so that's you know high blood pressure, and you're in a relatively safe range, but it's going up. There are doctors now that will prescribe forms of physical activity, uh, whether that's working with a personal trainer, but actually you know being in the outdoors. That is a viable prescription now for some doctors. And there are more and more doctors leaning towards that as a form of therapy because actually it turns out to be an awful lot cheaper and it changes behaviours and therefore improves health without having to spend any money. So actually social prescribing is the future, I think, of the health service. And you know, hopefully more doctors will start using that. And obviously it's the doctors that make the decisions you know, if you're gonna, if you're in a really bad place and you're gonna have a stroke, then there's no way on God's green earth that they're gonna say, right, no surgery, no medications. Yeah, I think it should be seen as a as a thing you can implement at any time. And I always feel like, you know, like with my dogs, I'm really careful about do they get enough exercise? Are they eating the right things? I measure out their food and make sure that they eat the the right thing and it's not got any junk in it. And then I think quite often by the end of the day I've run out of time to look after myself and I think well I'm not eating the right things I haven't had enough exercise today and we sort of take that level of care over dogs or children or whoever and sometimes just having a little look at our own schedules and thinking how much time did I have to myself last week and how much time you know did I go to bed at a decent hour and did I get enough sleep and and all of these things it's 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 really easy to talk about, but sometimes it's hard to set aside that time and just say, right, I'm I'm going to take some time and I'm going to go and do something just for me. And presumably, we we mentioned forest bathing, but that's not the only way to benefit from being in the outdoors, is it? So you could you, know, you can find an activity to do with children if you've got children or. If you've got mobility problems, you can find something that's accessible for you. And does it does it all have the the same benefits? Yeah, I mean, it, it does. I mean, it, it, the, the good thing about sort of the green space, I mean, the, the thing we talked about before about, the, you know, the Shinrin Yoku, that's that's going to have an impact regardless of your ailment, regardless of your situation. You know, just being immersed in that environment, will the, the fight, you know, the fighter signs will, will still be released and you will still get the benefits from that. But there, there's so many other things. There's so many other benefits from being in that space. So if you have mobility issues, then you you, you plan around your particular constraints. You know, and there's lots of parks and lots of other things where, you know, you, it doesn't matter whether you've got mobility issues, you can still immerse yourself in that environment. I mean, I see I see lots of older people sit on park benches and just watch the world go by. That's, you know, that's a, that's a brilliant strategy because, again, it's quite a distractive strategy. You're focusing on other things and just paying attention to the things around you. It doesn't require a massive amount of effort. And I think what you're talking about, you know, particularly around, you know, that with the dog, you'll, you'll plan everything for them because you feel responsible for them. Well, it's just about behavior change. It's about trying to change those little things in your life to make sure that you do accommodate you and give your give time to yourself. Now, it's easy saying that. It's a very difficult thing to actually do it. And, and, and you know, trying to bring about those little changes are significant. Like I say, I'm knocking on a little bit now. And I've started to, for the first time, I've got two children. And I didn't go for a walk for a long time when they were young, which I'm really kicking myself that I didn't do that now. But I actually, I've really hit it hard again. I'm, I'm now doing sort of 15, 20 mile walks again and, and absolutely adoring it, just being out all day, every day. Now, that's a massive swing in my behavior and my lifestyle, but it's a choice that I've made and I've, I'm sticking to it. It doesn't have to be quite as extreme as that. You know, it can be a lot, lot simpler and, and simply just 20 minutes, half an hour, just, just go for a walk or, or, you know, if you like paddling, go for a paddle, you know, just give yourself the time to do that at least once a week. I just want people to connect with the outdoors. I want people to feel like it's something important that that we need to look after. So I used to work in an outdoor centre, an outdoor education centre, and we'd take people out and we'd do stuff. And one thing I realised was there are a lot of people who think that if you're going to go out for a walk, it has to be this big 
hike up a mountain or it has to you know you have to get walking boots on and you have to do this and and you have to have walking poles and and I've always been really passionate about saying to people just do whatever is right for you like whatever is right and if that is sitting on a park bench then that's fine that's you know once you've got the interest and you've got that connection you probably find that you do want to explore a little bit more or you know your fitness improves and you you think I'm going to try a hill whatever it it doesn't matter but even though I've always had this really strong belief my dad has only just got into walking and it wasn't even me that did it because he's so used to it I think just ignoring me and his friends took him out for a walk and he did a Wainwright in the Lake District as his very first walk and he loved it and he he was amazed that he could do it because he's early 60s he's always been a bit of a drinker and a smoker and a rock and roller you know not necessarily looked after himself that that much and he was so proud of himself and he said it was really hard because it was really steep and he had to go really slowly but he was absolutely hooked and then he's he's come back and he said to me you know I want to go on more walks where can, where can we go and what what do I need and I have completely completely encouraged him like when it was his birthday I just bought him loads of walking stuff not that you need it but just I'm so happy that he's into it that I'm trying to encourage him but I was talking to him about why he hadn't ever gone walking before and and he said that he never felt like it was for him and you know he's a a white middle class cisgendered guy really if it was going to be for anybody it would have been for him but there was something about it he you know he just never felt like it was something that he was going to do he'd almost written it off as I don't know, living in a palace on an island that, you know, well, that's nice for whoever can do that, but it's not, it's never going to be me. And I think there's a lot of really, really difficult conversations happening about how to make the the outdoors feel accessible for all different types of people. And some of that conversation, well, it's not, it's not for now, but some of that conversation is to start with people wanting to do it and realising that that benefit is, is yeah. there. Well, I think a step before that, Hannah, I think uh, sometimes, I mean, for me, it was just part of my life because I lived in that environment where, you know, to play out, I was playing out in the Trough of Boland. That was where we used to play hide and seek. Most people play it around three houses. We were playing it in the whole trough and I had a fantastic little hideout in Langdon Castle that nobody ever found me. However, you know, a lot of people don't have that opportunity. So I think the stage before that is awareness that there is this beautiful world out there that you're failing to explore. And if I use my, I mean, obviously you used your dad as, as an example there. You know, my children, they're of a generation where they have their their world is on their phone or on the computer. They don't they don't even look outside of their window. So for me, it was about exactly what just happened with, with your dad is just introduce them to a, a low level fell with nice views. And you happen to mention, I think I took them when they were, I think they were about seven and 10 and I took them up at Blackfell in the Lake District and it's a Wayne, right? And it's not too hard to get to and you've got to walk through Tarn House, so it's beautiful and they loved it and we got to the top and said, oh, this is a Wayne, right? I left it there and on the way back, my daughter said to me, what's a Wayne, right? And I just said, well, you know, you're on your phone all the time, look it up. And it was like, there was the, in the back of the car, oh, so there's 214 Wayne, rights. And I said, yeah, yeah, that's just one of them. And it's one of the smaller ones. And she said, I want to do those. And it because we, you know, made her aware of, of of something and then just given her a really positive experience and a really enjoyable day. And then all of a sudden she's hooked. She's now wild camping with me. We, we, we want to do the Monroes together. She's absolutely hooked. The other daughter, any, it was a bit of physical exertion. She didn't like it. Uh, so I found something else. I introduced her to kayaking and it was just kayaking on on the local canal where I live. And uh, she loves it. So we're now planning a trip to Ascent doing sea kayaking. You know, so it's, it's not people like different things in the outdoors. It's just finding what suits that individual. So I've got two children that have been brought up by the same parents that have completely different passions in the outdoors. But the bottom line is they've both got a passion for it. And I suppose going back to your point about, you, you, you know, your father climbing a Wainwright and now he's, there's motivation to want to continue. There's a really good model around from positive psychology that it's called the PERMA theory. And it's, it's about creating positive emotions, whatever you know it is you're doing. But it's also talking about, that's an acronym for positive emotions, engagement, relationships, meaningfulness, and accomplishments. And when you actually start looking at walking or any form of outdoor activity, you can relate to all of those things. Positive emotions happen as a consequence of being in that space 
as far as I'm concerned. But then it's, you're, you are engaging in something that's effortful. You know, you will have relationships with the people that you, you, you're with. Now, in my instance, it's a little bit different because I spend all week talking to people after people after people. And I quite like the isolation of being in the outdoors. But other people are lonely and, and are looking for friendships and looking for like-minded people to engage in different activities. And that could be working for a, a wildlife trust, just cleaning a bank on a canal, or it could be anything. And then the meaningfulness, this idea of sense of purpose and meaning about doing some form of activity. And the final one, and this is what what relates for me, and, and I'm, I'm hoping to do a little bit of research around this, about the, the, the peak bagging thing. You know, why do people go after the 214 Wainwrights or the 282 Monroes or, you know, want to do every trail in the world? There's a sense of accomplishment of getting to that figure of 214 for the Wainwrights or actually doing doing one is a real accomplishment and it drives you to want to do the next one and the next one and the next one and it becomes quite addictive. Now, for me, that that is a really, really important part of the outdoors. If you can give somebody an experience in the outdoors that gives them a sense of accomplishment they're more likely to feel good about it and want to replicate that experience and probably progress onto something bigger and better. But the, the, I think that the big block is that awareness. It's, it's giving them an experience in the first place that they get a real wow experience and go, I want more of this. You know, How do we get children off their computers? Because there's some really good games. I've played a few myself, I, I won't lie. You know, but giving, giving them the time to, to get out in the fresh air and, and get in the outdoors is really important as well. It is so important to get kids outdoors. But I think at the same time, so I, I grew up with my mum and my dad split up when I was quite young. So my, my mum and my stepdad used to take me out walking every other weekend. And I hated it. And I was dragged up all these hills in the Lake District. And the only thing I was really interested in was when we stopped for Kate. And I used to quite like listening to the uh, charts on the way home in the car. But I didn't like the walking. I just, I wasn't interested at all. And then I went to uni and I went to Bristol and suddenly, no offence to Bristol, the landscape is not the same as Lancashire and, and the Lake District. And it was that actually, I, I moved back home after uni and suddenly I had the appreciation for what, what I'd had all this time. And and then I got into the outdoor industry and started doing some some stuff myself and, and developed a love for just being outside and I I really like just walking along a beach and looking at the pebbles and, you know, looking for mushrooms and looking at different types of tree bark and, and all of those things. So actually, I don't particularly do anything terribly energetic anymore. And I've just I've got a new puppy quite recently and I couldn't do anything very long with him either. But we just like mooch around some woods and have a nice time. And, and I think that's You've got to find what suits you at that period of your life. And hopefully, yeah, once you, once you enjoy it, then you can develop that. I, I agree. And I, and I think this is where it, there's no hard and fast rule. You know, you don't have to do something that's big. You don't have to go and do one of the biggest Munros to feel like you're, you know, you've accomplished something. It, it is, it's scalable. It really is scalable. And it's, it's moving from the indoors to the outdoors. You know, that's not a massively energetic thing to do but it's a significant shift and and it's like you say once you start introducing things like for example one of my daughters loves grassmere gingerbread so if we go if we go for a walk in the lakes then we have to go and get a pack of gingerbread you know the other one will do anything for ice cream so <laughs> yeah. it's, it's throwing those little things in because they become <laughs> the, the brain is really good at creating associations regardless of how painful the experience might be of walking up a mountain and it is it is painful but that but you associate that pain with the positives of a accomplishing the peak of getting up to the top or or experiencing the things around you whatever the whatever the scale may be and those nice things as well so you end up in general having a real positive experience even though part of it might be quite horrible you know in terms of the perception of pain i quite like that perception of pain and that's probably because i've come from the world of elite sport but for me i i actually think that's an associate that's an association with achievement yeah. you know that that sense of pain like i'm i'm i've got doms now um <laughs> i'm a really big walk that i did yesterday so tomorrow's going to be even worse but that for me is a sense of accomplishment because i know yesterday was a really big walk and i loved every second of it yeah know? and you can be a bit smug when you're kind of creaking around like oh, oh i did a big walk yesterday <laughs> <laughs> nice. 
Yeah, because I'm on I'm on I'm on another round of of obviously the Wayne rights and I ticked loads off yesterday. So again, going back to that positive psychology model, that perma theory, that model, accomplishments of not only getting to the top of a peak and doing a certain walk, but actually being able to tick off a few off my list is another form of it's just like a, an added bonus to the sense of accomplishment that you get from being in the outdoors. But we held a conference here about three three or four months ago now with a charity called Mind Over Mountains. And it's all around mental health and it's about being in the outdoors. And, and one of the things that really came through from that was this, the variety of what you can do to get the benefits. You know, we have people from Lancashire Wildlife Trust here show, showcasing some of the things that they did. And it was it was people who were probably my age that were a little bit lonely, just wanted to be with other people. And it was all they were doing was going around, you know, cleaning up the paths. But they were having a fantastic time. You know, they were having a really good experience doing it. Not particularly effortful, done at a really low pace. But actually, what an amazing experience. You know, you're, you're, you're in a, a fantastic green space, making a difference to the community around you as well by cleaning up the paths. That sense of accomplishment and that sense of meaningfulness and sense of purpose actually make you feel incredible. It, interestingly, one of the... One of the number one things to make people happy, one of the number 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 one factors to make people happy is doing something for others, you know? So actually doing something that's making a difference for somebody else, like the, the guys that do Fix the Fells, they are my absolute heroes because they make my life easier. They're not doing it for the good of themselves. They're doing it for the good of the community that they serve. And, um, you know, get more people like that than actually that we're making the countryside more appealing and therefore get more people in it. That's one of the perceived downsides for getting more people outdoors is that there's a lot of these headlines of you know people parking inconsiderately and people going to the toilet in inappropriate places and inappropriate ways and it riles me and I completely understand you know if, if an ambulance can't get through because somebody's parked badly then that is pe people need to be aware of that and there needs to be a bit of re-education about that but I think the assumption is always oh, these people who don't know how to hill walk and how dare they come and enjoy these hills. And and that bit particularly, I just think, no, no, like, let's not make the assumption that it's all these 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 newbies to the outdoors. Like I, I personally, I, I want it to be that the outdoors is for everybody. And I know it's not as simple as that. And I know there are many, many reasons why people can't access the outdoors. But, you know, ideologically, I want it to be for everybody. And if that means that we do need to do a bit of talking about what some of the, the rules are or some of the ways that we can help sustain this environment, you know, if everybody discovered that they loved hill walking and then realised that, you know, these these paths don't look after themselves or this bit might need, this this wall needs re-walling or whatever, if there's that huge group of people who are passionate about it, and we say, do you know what, fix the fells, run volunteer days, get yourself booked on one of those. If everybody did one, even if everyone did one every five years, you know, that it's just a way of sort of giving back to the community in actually in a really fun way. I, I did a day a few years ago, I did a day with the Canal and River Trust um, balsam bashing for Himalayan balsam. And it was so therapeutic. Just this is what Himalayan balsam is. There's some explanation of why it's bad. It's, you know, it's invasive. It squeezes out all the other plants. Just go and pull it up. And just, it felt really bad in the beginning. She's like, are you sure we're just pulling up this plant that's actually quite pretty? But it, that was great. And I just, we were just talking. There was a, a group of us and they had hot chocolate and biscuits. And we just pulled up balsam for a couple of hours. And that was a really nice thing to do. And you're right, it does give you a bit of a, it's a nice circular economy if yeah you i think so give back. i think one of you know the, the, there's this altruism this giving back to others which i think is a really important thing for happiness but there's all you know my children are make connections through those types of activities as well so for me if you get friends with, with like-minded thinking and like the, you know like-minded interests then I, I i strongly believe that you can you can pull people away from the computer you know and get people focused on i mean another example of that is I took my daughter this weekend to the, the first agricultural show. She's never been before. And she wants to go to all of them now. She wants to go to the Lancashire one. She wants to go to Wensleydale one. She wants to go everywhere. And I think it's back to this awareness. There's, there's a lot of people that live in an urban environment that think 
rural is is a different world and you can't you know there's no way that we can get there and i do think that there are clearly there are parks in and around most most cities and towns but if you want to get a real experience of the outdoors then we need to make it accessible for them as well so one of the things that we're one of the initiatives that we're doing at the university here in uclan is we're putting on buses for people that want to go and have a walk around the trough for example because that's one of our easiest and you know quite easy place to get to if you were trying to get there by bus then it's going to take you all day to get there you're not really going to get much of an experience and then have to come all the way back having gone on about three different buses so we're trying to make that accessible for people to give them that exposure to say look it doesn't cost you anything really to have a wander around these spaces you know if you can get here yourself then you can wander around these spaces as much as you like so i think i think this the, the accessibility bit and the exposure is is probably the most important thing and going back to the problem of people having you know fires in the side of the road creating their own little, they think everybody can just have a fire and that's okay it's it's education you know people don't realize that what they're doing is damaging the environment i'm sure they don't intend to damage the environment i'm sure some do but the majority don't and i think it's about how we can change people's understanding of of what is right and what is wrong and and i've seen a lot more groups now cropping up on things like facebook that are offering people to join those groups and 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 go out and do things with them and i think simply by being with an educated group of people that you learn you learn your well, the rights and wrongs of of being in the outdoors from senior members of the group so you know more organized activities like that for me is a really good thing and i'm seeing a lot of that now a lot of walking leaders we run mountain leader courses and uh, hill and moorland courses etc and we we're, we're having a lot of a lot of people coming to us now demanding just straightforward walking leaders so that they might want to do a section of the ribble way or just take a group of people and feel confident and comfortable that they're qualified to do that and i think the people that then go on those group walks will learn from the person that's leading it so i think there is a general education that needs to be had yeah yeah and I, th- you know there were there were a lot of people that went out a bit more during covid and hopefully they are you know they they're also seeing the the countryside code signs and and learning little bits like that that you kind of learn through doing and you might make the odd mistake but I suppose, yeah, for me, I think I do want people to get out and explore and and have a good time, but really do need to be mindful of of your own capabilities and make sure you're staying safe. We work with Mountain Rescue and they're always trying to get that message across of, you know, Mountain Rescue are there if they're needed. But there are a couple of, of really simple things that people can do just to make sure that they're, you know, hopefully not going to need rescuing Two weeks ago, I was up on Blencathra and I had to help two lads down that were that had heat exhaustion. They went up with no rucksack in a pair of trainers at the top of Blencathra, no water. So I, I had extra because I knew there'd be somebody up there that, that didn't have any water. So I, had to, I gave them two bottles, asked them to sip it, and I had to walk them off the mountain. Now, I could have left them there, <laughs> but it could have deteriorated. And that's just that's just me on that one day. That must happen daily. I remember going up Scarfell Pike and uh, there were two lads again, completely underdressed and they got to the top of Seathwaite Fell and they said is this Scarfell Pike so I said yes it is <laughs> and then they went back yeah. down I thought there's no way you're going to Scarfell Pike looking like that so there is, there's, there's still a lot of work to be done there is you know there is still a lot of work to be done but we should concentrate on that you know on the education side of it and 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 offering people the opportunity to come on group walks so that they understand what the etiquette is and they understand what what is appropriate and what isn't you know but yesterday I was at Monday, Monday, I saw two people the whole day. So this idea that the Lake District is saturated is not true. You know, maybe Ambleside, Windermere and uh, Keswick, maybe, but there's an awful lot more than, than the towns of, of the Lake District to, to explore. Yeah, there is. And someone said to me the other day that, you know, it's really nice to get that sense of solace and, and quiet, but also it just shows what a wasted opportunity there is there because because there's nobody in these places and you think and I've never thought of it like that you know I think a lot of people go out and they they want to find somewhere that is all to themselves but there's a lot of space out there for where we are we're a crowded country but there is plenty of space out there for everybody to enjoy I want people who are already enjoying the benefit of the outdoors to be welcoming and and get rid of this slightly snobby attitude towards people who might be 
wearing the wrong type of footwear you know you're right there is a safety element and then people should have that awareness of the, what what footwear you need and how the weather changes when you get up high and, and that sort of thing but you're trying to do it in a kind way yeah. rather than a pointing and laughing way and I think sometimes we there is a bit of that in the community of you know unless you're wearing the latest fashion for mountaineering what are you doing here or unless you're the right size or you know there's there's a lot of judgment which doesn't help people getting into it either I, I agree with you and I think sometimes that can put people off because it can be expensive you know, if you start wanting the very best boots and the very best, you know, Gore-Tex jackets, then that's out of the remit of quite a lot of society. And I think making making the mountains accessible is the, is the biggest challenge. And actually, I remember when I was a kid, I didn't have all the fancy gear. My mum knitted me a jumper that kind of kept me warm. I did have a decent pair of boots, but that was it, you know. And and I made do and I, and I stuck to my skill sets, I suppose, at that particular point. And then over time, you accrue them if it's something that you're interested in. But you're right. I think there is there's definite snobbery, and you see it a lot in in most communities where people will always have a moan about something, but not be prepared to do anything about it themselves. You know, and and for me, it's about rather than focusing your energy on moaning, why don't you focus your energy on doing something about it? Go and do a walking leaders course, and next time you see somebody, just drop them a card and say, why don't you come with me on the next walk, and I'll show you how to do it, or or I'll show you how to, you know, navigate this thing, or I'll show you how to, you know, what kind of equipment is right for this type of walks. And as soon as you do that, then all of a sudden, I mean, that's, I learned that from scouts, you know, and it, it's a shame that there's not more people and, and more, more. I mean, I think scouts is probably re- reduced in the numbers uh, over a you know, period of time, but we need more things like that to educate. I mean, there's a lot more Duke of Edinburgh going on in schools, which is good. And and, and I think some some the problem is in some environments they 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 put them off because they beast them. They 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 go from doing nothing to doing like a, a twelve miler uh, straight away. And and kids don't like the pain that you get from that, particularly wearing your boots that aren't really worn in. So it's about it goes back to what we said at the very start about you didn't really enjoy it because it hurt. But you make those associations with nice things. Well, if you're going to do something that you know is going to be quite painful, make sure you put in some real positive things like a barbecue or an ice cream or something positive that will come from it as well. And I think that way you learn, you learn to make those associations and, and eventually it will become part of your narrative. It will just become part of the way you live your life. I remember, was it, it must be two weeks ago, I was coming off Helvellyn down Dolly Wagon Pike to, to the Grisdale Tarn. Uh, I, I was walking back to Glen Ridden along Grisdale Beck and I saw a family and the dad was dragging these two kids up. And I thought they will never walk again because the experience is just miserable. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's about that scaling and making sure what's right for you isn't necessarily what's right for them. Yeah, there's a similar theory that I studied when I was studying outdoor education about, you know, in order for something to have a really positive impact, there has got to be an element of adventure. And if it's too low on that adventure scale, then it, it doesn't really do anything because it's not ticking the box. But there's a sweet spot where you get just the right amount of adventure. And if you overdo it, you go into misadventure. And then, yeah, similar to what you said, once you're in misadventure, it, it can actually be really damaging. And my very first caving experience was definitely misadventure. I was expecting it to be a big old show cave and... And we went into this tiny hole in the ground and it was it was basically it was exactly what everyone expects caving to be really small and squeezy and and quite traumatic. And the week after we had to go right back to and then we did go into an old show cave because there was half the group were hated it. And actually, at the end, I studied outdoor ed for two years. And at the end, caving was my favorite activity. It's such a personal thing. So it is really hard for the for the tutor to to get it right for everybody in the group because my level of, of adventure may just naturally be lower than other people's level of adventure but for me that day was in the misadventure category which then took me quite a lot of work to get over and to still go out there and do that and for some people you get one opportunity and if you push it it's too much i feel sorry for these leaders as well because uh, they have you know in terms of that adversity is is it's going to be different for everybody in the group. So hitting a sweet spot can be a bit of a challenge sometimes. Yeah, it's really tough because some people are just, you know, I've always been quite cautious and sensible. So I was 
I was always going to be at the lower end of that, like wanting to make sure everything was safe, really. I don't want to do anything that if I feel like I'm not going to be safe doing it. But then there's other people and they thrive on that. Oh, it feels like it's a bit unsafe or, you know, there's an element of excitement there for them that they they need to get to that thing. But what is nice is that that's a really personal learning experience as well of how do I respond to that. And since that course, I feel like I've, you know, I will have been in situations where I've been less comfortable and I'm able to notice that and to process it perhaps a little better than I, I was before doing that course. And and for me, the, the two years of outdoor education was like a, it, you know, it taught me a lot about me as a person. And I think that probably will resonate with a lot of people as well. You know, you go and you do these. Some people have to do thousands of miles of running or cycling or whatever to get to that introspective point. But you can learn an awful lot about yourself when you strip back those layers of comfort that we're we're so used to surrounding ourselves with. And it, that go, it goes back to the start of the podcast, really, about it's not about adventure. It's about doing something that's relevant to you that's going to make a positive impact on your life. And if that's sitting on a park bench being surrounded by trees and people, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, people listening to this podcast, it's it's a bit preaching to the choir because they are probably already quite outdoorsy, but maybe they could think of a person that they'd like to introduce some of those benefits to. And maybe they could think, how could I get so-and-so to enjoy the outdoors and, and have a little think about activities that they could do? Or That'll double the population of people in the outdoors. If, you know, if everybody picks one person to introduce at the outdoors to. You're more likely to do it, aren't you? If you've, again, with me being quite, I like to be safe and comfortable. If somebody said to me, do you want to try this thing that you've never done before? I've got a lot of experience and I'll make sure you're okay. Then I'm much, much more likely to go, yeah, okay. I'm a bit nervous, but okay. Can you promise that you'll slow down if you go too fast or can you make sure there's somewhere I can have a wee because I don't want to wee in a bush or whatever it is that people have got these. People will have obstacles. their natural anxieties, won't they? There'll be things that they are worried about and it's about mitigating those risks. I, I take Sometimes I take a rope when I go with my daughter, even you know, it's on like a grade one scramble because she's more than capable of doing it. But if it makes her feel comfortable that I can top rope her, then great. You know, it's worth doing because if, if I didn't take it, then she might not go. So, yeah, thank you, Brian, for joining me. Just, I suppose, the last thing that I would mention is places where people can go to look for more information. Obviously, the Cicerone website has got lots and lots of articles. We've got things about how to get into navigation. We've got things about kit that you need. So there's that. There's also, we mentioned Fix the Fells, who do the volunteer care days, and they're a, a wonderful organisation. Wildlife Trusts, yeah, RSPB have sort of get out and learn to bird watch. There's all sorts of things. I suppose council, the council, local council websites might have signposts towards things. Mountain training do introductory courses. So they, they're the ones that do the Hill and Moorland Leader course that you were talking about. But they also do just general walking skills. Yeah, there's loads of navigation courses you can do. We've got a navigation little mini guide that teaches you lots of navigation skills which is brilliant so yeah i hopefully there's there's things we've mentioned that are enough but please do get in touch if there's anything that you're unsure about or if you'd like a, a, a resource and i'm sure we can find something else and if you're interested in going and studying health and sports science then i guess go and see yeah. brian at you come on down yeah uh, obviously go on, the, go on the website i think if anybody does have an interest in the outdoors then you know particularly have an interest around health and the outdoors then then do have a look on the website and if you want to try and get in touch with me directly then we can we can talk about it feel free to to contact me great thank you so much for for joining us brian and thanks for listening i hope you enjoyed it it was a little bit of a different episode to normal so please do let me know what you think you can email me at live at cicerone.co.uk and I'd love to hear from you. If there is an outdoorsy subject that you're particularly passionate about that you'd like to discuss, get in touch with me as well and maybe you could be our, our next guest on the podcast. Please follow or subscribe on your favourite podcast app or provider so that you never miss an episode of the podcast. You can also check out the Cicerone website, as I mentioned, which is www.cicerone.co.uk. 
you can browse our full range of guidebooks, read the articles, sign up to the newsletter, all sorts of things. Uh, you can also find us on social media if you search Cicerone Press on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or we're on LinkedIn as well. You can also join our Facebook community group, Cicerone Connect, to connect with other outdoor enthusiasts and carry on the conversation there. Thank you so much for joining us and I hope you enjoyed it and I will speak to you soon. Bye.